There's a mark on every stage around the world that signifies the center of its depth and width, called Center Center. Friend of the pod, James Whiteside, has dreamed of standing on that very mark as a principal dancer with the prestigious American Ballet Theater ever since he was a 12-year-old, blown away by watching the company's spring gala. This new, almost memoir, Center Center, is an exuberant behind-the-scenes tour of Whiteside's triple life, both on and off stage. Hear us chat with James about the inspiration behind the book, what the writing process was like, and what he hopes readers will ultimately take away from this collection of essays in episode 247. Grab your copy of Center Center now, wherever books are sold, or click the link in the description of this episode. The holidays are right around the corner, and if you are looking for a great gift for the dance lover in your life, we have the perfect place to start. As longtime listeners know, we have covered so many great dance books on the podcast, so we have compiled a list of our absolute favorites. Check out our COD reading list at the link in the description of this episode or on our website, conversationsondancepod.com. This list has over 20 titles from Friends of the Pod and some of our longtime favorites for essential reading. Support Friends of the Pod this holiday season while supporting us too. Shop the COD reading list now. I'm Rebecca King Ferraro. And I'm Michael Sean Breeden, and you're listening to Conversations on Dance. This week on Conversations on Dance, we are joined by award winning choreographer Kyle Abraham. Kyle's choreographic talents garnered attention quickly in works he created for his company, AIM, leading to a MacArthur Fellowship in 2013 and commissions from some of the world's most respected dance institutions. We talked to Kyle about his creative process leading up to his new work, Requiem, Fire in the Air of the Earth, that will premiere at Stanford Live this December 4th. If you're in the Stanford area, ticket info is at the link in the description of this episode. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kyle. Uh, we've been wanting to have you on the podcast for a long time, and we're so happy we've been able to make this work out. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just go ahead and start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about how you first got interested in dance. Yeah, sure. I found my way into dance. So I, I grew up dancing a lot, um, but not studying dance or anything like that. Mm. And uh, one of the memories that came up just last week when I was in my hometown, uh, Pittsburgh, was um, showing a friend of mine the Catholic school that I got kicked out of on the first day <laughs> of um, first grade because I got new penny loafers and was dancing. Um, so uh, that was uh, the beginning and the end. Um, oh, they should have put you uh, in classes instead of kicked you out. I know. Come on. I, I think, I think my, ironically, I think maybe I went to karate, you know, mm. and um, my sister was That's in cool. dance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I didn't take a formal dance class until I was um, 16 turning 17 uh, oh. because I was a big rave kid and uh, I did like our high school musical that the year that they were doing a Caribbean musical because I had long rave hair. Um, and uh, a lot of just great suggestion had led me to study dance. Uh, the teachers at my high school um, who got me to audition for that musical gave me a scholarship to take class to get ready for the musical my senior year. Mm -hmm. And then the teachers that I was studying with over the summer were like, you should come to the performing arts high school. Um, so I went there half day and just really loved it and fell in love with it. Wow. What was That's your most direct way of getting to that point there. <laughs> what was your, in that initial training? Like once you started some formal training, what was the first thing you dove into? Yeah. The first thing I had was a class called boys jazz. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if they have gendered jazz anymore. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah. It was boys jazz with a teacher named Buddy Thompson. Um, oh, yeah. wow. That's interesting. I've never thought about that. I mean, I obviously like as ballet dancers, you know, they still, you have to take jazz and modern and, you know, they want you to be well-rounded, well but of course, like my whole ballet training was always gendered and then not for anything else, but I've never, so I've never heard of that. So what, what kind of things do you, do you remember what you did that were, would have been oh my God. like, yeah different, from class. Class. yeah, different from the girls class. What would you been you know, doing? I don't know what the ladies were doing. I don't think, you know what, they didn't have, they didn't have a separate class. I think because a lot of the guys were starting so late. It was in some ways a better way for them to frame like, um, you know, tutorial or something like that, like jazz right. tutorial. But we did a lot of hitch kicks, a lot of cross ball change. 
Um, <laughs> and if you look at any, the first dances I made, those are the steps that are most prominent. <laughs> right. So that, that begs the question then, when did you start to, um, express an interest in making dances as well? Was that kind of right as you were starting to have more formal dance training yourself? I mean, even before all that stuff, really, you know, I made like church, the dances at church camp to songs that I shouldn't be making dances to at church camp. Um, Give us some examples. Poison, <laughs> Belle Biv DeVoe. <laughs> Wait, that's amazing. That's so good. I, you know, at Camp Calvary, you know, why not? Oh, um, so good. I love it. Uh, so it's like stuff like that. But then I, and I'd make up solos in my room. Um, and I remember there were two times that I made a solo for myself before setting dance to kind of show my family that I was interested in setting dance. Um, and that was um, some point in middle school, making a dance to a Prince song to show my parents that I wanted to study dance. But that just didn't pan out because the day that I went to go visit the performing arts middle school, the kids weren't dancing. They were just running around and <laughs> flirting with each other. Um, and then high school was the same thing where I did a dance to a Prince song called Still Will Stand All Time from the Graffiti Bridge soundtrack. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I did a dance to that. And, and it's always been a thing where I was making solos. And then at that high school, again, it's a Prince song, um, Another Lonely Christmas in the Christmas show. <laughs> I love it. In the Unitar. <laughs> so good. So clearly music was a very important part of maybe your inspiration behind dance. And we will talk about that more when we talk about um, what you will be seeing at Stanford Live coming up. But tell us a little bit about maybe if that was always your impetus for creating dance, like how does music play a role in those early for, uh, years for you? Yeah, you know, I don't know. It's I guess it's, it is music in a way, but more than that, it can be emotion because I think like a lot of your listeners, you know, it's like, you at some point in your life go in your room and you emote through movement. Some people sing, but I think everyone has done some little dance in the, I shouldn't say little, has done some kind of dance in their room, yeah. um, you know, to get those feelings out. Yeah. And I think for me studying dance, it really was just um, having more tools or more colors to play with, to be that much more expressive. Mm -hmm. right. um, and where music comes to play, I think, yeah, I've just always had a love of music and I started out in music before dance, playing a lot of different instruments and things. Um, and in some cases, I like to choreograph to songs that I really like as a way of kind of um, showing people that may not be familiar with the music how much I love that music. Right. Yeah. I like that. So at what point did you have an idea then that you could take dance and make it into something that is, you know, a professional living, like, and what kind of shape were you seeing that for yourself? <laughs> I'm like, never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I think I'm, I'm still pleasantly surprised that um, this is a, my career and the, my bills are paid, <laughs> you know, um, because, you know, it's still a thing and people still refer to dance as a hobby, which yeah. You know, she wanted You've to all had that happen. <laughs> you know? What do you actually do? Meeting someone at a bar. What yeah. do you do though? Yeah. No, that's my so, yeah, I don't yeah, I don't know how best to answer it. I think well, maybe there is an answer. I'll try not to be as long-winded. I think um when I went to graduate school the first time around um and wasn't able to create as much dance and study dance as much in that program. I realized that I wanted to, to be more immersed in it. Mm -hmm. And then I think after grad school and being like broke, five broke, which so many people are after grad school, um, I still considered myself a dancer and choreographer, even if I couldn't afford to be right. um, or think that I can afford to be. So um, just always finding a way to make, um, made it my profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what were, what were some of those ways? It sounds like you had to be creative and kind of like have like a sort of like scrappy, we're going to do this energy in those early days. Like what were some of those early works that you were making like? Yeah. I mean, I was still making dances in my, at that point, basement studio apartment, but, um, and then get them out of that apartment and show them um, at places like Joy Soho, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, or St. Mark's Church uh, Dance Space Project um, uh, at St. Mark's Church. 
the radio show, which was one of our biggest um, shows as a company, um, is a work that some of that material I made in my basement studio. And some of it was also a result of having a residency at Joy Soho to, mm-hmm. to kind of create material. Um, but we were still at a point where like the dancers were like paid by like a stipend, you know? And if we were able to get any kind of residency, I used my food stamps to pay for our per diem, which was basically us just having group dinners. You know, I just go to the grocery store, use use that, um, use those food stamps, buy us all of our groceries and we cook together. And in in some ways it was a a more like honestly familial experience um, than what can happen now because you have to have all these different boundaries. It's like Mm -hmm. the more formal things get, the more sterile they get. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So at what point did you actually... Um, you know, you come up with the name and formalize the company Abraham in Motion. Like, but when? What year was that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sometime. Yeah, no, I always hated it. Um, <laughs> I think um, uh, I just like the acronym. I was like, this is going to be really good for grants. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I think a lot of other people think the same because they all have an AIM. <laughs> uh-huh. um, yeah. Ironically, we don't even refer to it as Abraham in Motion anymore at all. Now it's just aimed by Kyle Abraham, which uh-huh. again, not the biggest fan of that. Um, but that was like the board kind of saying, well, your name needs to be in this new title and you need to keep it connected to in some ways what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how we've landed where we are now. You know, but, you're not the first person I've heard say this, um, like my, it, that the, a board or, you know, money will pressure you to use your name. But the artist always wants to kind of shy away from that. It's like it feels a little uncomfortable. I love that. Like yeah. artists are inherently humble like that or maybe not everyone, but. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because then it's like with my name and then people think that like I want it to be about me. And I'm like, that's so not the case. Like oh. right. next level, not the case. Sure. I can see that. When were, how were you initially finding dancers to be a part of when we're talking about this very early stages of the company? Where were yeah. you scouting people? Yeah. Um, some of them were people that I, were in the undergrad program while I was in grad school. Um, I went to NYU for grad school. I don't talk about it so much because I think most of what I learned was in my undergrad, uh, which was at SUNY Purchase. Um, and during that time at Purchase, yeah, I just met a lot of great dancers and studied with amazing teachers and choreographers. Uh, and so some of the dancers that I worked with early on were people that I um, met um, during undergrad. Some of those were folks in the grad program while I was at um, Tisch, and then people that I'd meet taking classes um, in the city on the weekends. Uh, that was kind of how we all kind of came together. Yeah. And then you mentioned a board. When did it become like, oh gosh, we got to get a board? We got to do the whole formal, like the name came, yeah. but also the formal aspects of it. Yeah, sure. I was doing a solo um, in someone's uh apartment for like a big kind of funding event for um dancers responding to aids uh broadway characters equity fights aids um and um chris calkins um someone who's now on my board uh Mm -hmm. was in in the audience and his wife uh, bb newworth had just hosted um the uh, dancers Find AIDS event at Fire Island, um, maybe like a month or two before then, mm-hmm. somewhere somewhere in that time frame. And she had asked me to do a to do a something for her for an event she was she was doing. Um, and Chris just came up to me and was like, you know, if you're ever interested in you know starting a board, I'd love to. Bibi and I would love to, you know help you in some kind of way. And I was like, oh my God, yeah, sure. Let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And that was in 2011, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And I I mean, like without their support then and now, it probably wouldn't have happened. (laughs) Right. I mean, from there, things did start to kind of snowball for you. You got your MacArthur Fellowship not too too long after. Um, I love in an interview you did, you were talking about how it actually kind of put you in your head a little bit, like you didn't feel like deserving yet of that acknowledgement, um, which is just such an, I mean, it's just such an artist thing. Like you you get, you, you've you been, clearly you've been working your butt off for years by that point. You literally are 
giving your own food stamps to your dancers so that you can take care of them and like as your family. And then you finally get the acknowledgement and it's like, I don't know if this is for me yet. (laughs) Yeah. But there's so many people who had been struggling well before I was struggling, you know, and there's so many artists that I have looked up to over the years that still haven't received that kind of recognition. And so it's really daunting and humbling and all of the things to receive those type of accolades um, A, at that age and B, with the amount of work that I had put out versus, um, mm-hmm. not versus, but in comparison to, to my colleagues and to my peers. So. Do you feel like now that you've had that acknowledgement, you have a platform where you can put those voices forward a little bit more? Like people that you had respected or looked up to? Yeah, I mean, honestly, that was part of the kind of reckoning I had where I was like, well, I'm just going to say that maybe part of the reason why I'm getting this award is because I do always acknowledge the people that came before me and that inspire me in everything that I do. If I teach a class, I say where things are derived from. Sure. I go to shows. I always go to shows, but not in a way of that kind of dirty word networking, but mm-hmm. I go to shows because I want to learn. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So I go to see, you know, artists like Garth Fagan and I'll go and see Faye Driscoll and B.B. Miller and Anna Sperber. So like all these different artists from different walks of life, Camille Brown, and learn things. It's not even like even if those some of those folks I named are my friends, I'm not going to always stick around and, you know, say the stuff after the show. I'll probably call them a day later or a couple of days later um, mm-hmm. and they understand, you know, it's like yeah. I don't need to be there for that. I was there to show to show support, but also to be inspired, which I always am. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like none of that was part of the question. Uh, <laughs> I like it. I, 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 whatever tangent we're on, we we love it. We but. love tangents. <laughs> um, yeah, cool. tangent. yeah. um, no, it, it's making me wonder. Then, obviously, you derive inspiration from a lot of different places, and um, but what would you say some of your your biggest sources of inspiration are? It doesn't need we need necessarily need to be dance related or oh yeah your dancers, but like what what do you take from in your creative process? Yeah, a lot of that. Um, thanks for that. And that also reminds me of what I was supposed to say on the way. <laughs> but, um, the uh, inspiration for me, a lot of it comes can come from really anything. I think, you know, this show that we'll be doing in Seattle uh, or um, in Stanford, that show, like I was watching a lot of like Vampire Diaries, the originals, you know, and part of it for me sometimes is that, time to be away from dance just be like okay I'm just gonna shut down for an hour I usually give myself like an hour where I'll Mm -hmm. eat dinner and watch a show Mm -hmm. Um, you know like a lot of people a lot of drag race but it's just that one hour (laughs) um and so it's that becomes part of the inspiration you know um going to museums and galleries when I just you know I just need uh, another kind of outlet or just a little bit of escapism it does find its way into the work um a lot of what I wind up reading um, plays a part. I don't know if you want me to name names. I can always name. Sure. Name, yeah. Yeah. Drop yeah, it. Why drop not? it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. People are looking for Octavia books to read. Butler, of course. Mm-hmm. What am I? I just right now I'm reading um, real life. Brandon T- Brandon Taylor um, just finished um, the friend um, Sonia Nunez. That was really lovely. Um, but yeah, all those things. Sometimes you don't even know how they'll play a part, and then you're like in the studio, and then this idea comes up, and as you go to describe it it winds up being a description that is referencing something that I watched or read or experienced. Right. Right. So we're talking a lot about you working with your company and your dancers. When did you start to get some outside commissions? What was one of your first big commissions? Well, my very first commission, I think might've been from, um, not to make it nepotistic, but my best friend, um, <laughs> Stacy Pearl, uh, in Pittsburgh, she was running a company called Expressions, um, and she commissioned me um, to make a work when I first moved back to Pittsburgh, um, and that was really cool. Um, yeah, and then from there, it was like Ailey too, um, and you know, of course, Ailey. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There's lots of, I think maybe that, that yeah, Expressions was probably the first in like 2001 or two. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was definitely many years between that one and anything and else. That oh, interesting. Right. 
How do you how find do- that working on those commissions differ? <laughs> We're going to ask the same question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Going. No, it's the same. Um- yeah, I knew. <laughs> we, have, we, we, we sometimes share a brain. We've done yeah. uh, like over 200 of these now. So <laughs> very, yeah. We're both going to take it to the same place. <laughs> of how is it different working with, um, you know, coming into a company, an organization where you don't know the dancers uh, versus working with your home company where it's like, you know them so well, you hired them. Like, how is that different? Yeah, you know, it's pluses and minuses, really. Um, There's a lot that I can do elsewhere that isn't always possible Mm -hmm. in-house. There's maybe bigger staff um, in some of these other places. They've been going longer. So there's certain things that, like, from a production standpoint, are second nature to them, which makes me feel like I have that much more freedom with my Mm -hmm. creativity. Um. Yeah, with my dancers, I know them well enough to know that, like, if I had, ha- like, I'm going to just say had to, as if it was a, a hardship, which, which it isn't. But if it were, I'm like, oh, sure, I can make a dance. Boom, I gotcha. Right. Whereas if I'm going elsewhere, it can be more challenging to get to know someone because it really is like, granted, most talks I give, I refer to things like dating, but I mean that in the most kind of platonic of ways, um, <laughs> where I'm like, it's kind of like dating, right? Like you really need to get to know each other, sure. um, see how, you know, the kind of exchange is going with the type of material, the way that I give, the way I'm speaking mm-hmm. um, and engaging. I need to see how that's responded to, to make something. Um, and in a lot of ways, it's like when I'm going somewhere for the first time, I really think it's the second work is the work that like is maybe the truest right? Uh, because I've learned those dancers more and the way the organization works. Mm-hmm. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about this dating process? Like if you, if you're going somewhere <laughs> brand new, let's say New York city ballet, for instance, and they don't know your um, aesthetic or vocabulary, like what, how would you go into the studio and just start creating or do you need to explore a little bit before and like just give sequences and kind of push and, pull and see where they are at in relation to what you want to give. Yeah, sure. I, I think what I tend to do these days, especially with some of these commissions, because again, in comparison to my company where I can say, I'm going to take two years to make a work, mm-hmm. these commissions are like, okay, you have three weeks, <laughs> you have six weeks. And then um, it's on stage right after that sometimes, yeah. right? It's like the three weeks yeah. and then on stage, that's it. Boom. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> um, but so in those cases, I do a fair amount of pre-gaming, even with my company, there's a lot of pre-game. It may not be with phrase work with my company mm-hmm. or with the commissions. Um, I will generally have maybe like two different phrases that I'll throw out on that first day, if not more. Mm-hmm. And they'll be ideally, they're very different in terms of quality. Sure. So I can kind of see how they respond. Um, and kind of go from there. What does day one look like? Do you do an audition process? I know like Michael and I are dancing with Miami City Ballet. We had repetitors come in, choreographers come in. Everybody's process was kind of different. So would you do an audition day? Michael and I are laughing because it was not <laughs> our favorite day. But we understand you got to really. do it. <laughs> yeah. And now I have to do them for Justin. Like I, I really thought like, and you think like Justin is pretty classical, straightforward ballet, but it's like sometimes you just, you can't tell from class. Like it's right. still different. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, I know it's it's, funny. it's like the second that you mentioned Justin, I, I always just want to have a digression to say how amazing he is because I feel like even though he's celebrated, he's still underrated. I feel like he is like the bee's knees um, <laughs> and a good person, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, he's like yeah. the next level talented and a good human being. Okay, yes, uh, shout out to thing. Justin, <laughs> yeah, my dude. Um, yeah, I don't. I think, yeah, for me, I do like to have that first day audition if I can. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that sometimes I have to cheat the system and like at City Ballet, they don't really like you to do that. Yeah. yeah. But I'm like, that's <laughs> all everybody. Right. But like those first couple of days are really telling if I don't know a dancer. Right. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, yeah. There's no really other way, cheat. really. What's that? There's no really other way. Like, I get it. I understand yeah. the necessity of it. I mean, for yeah. Sure. Well, you think you, you have instincts for yourself, but like. It, sometimes people surprise you over a period of time or conversely disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. That can happen. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like, I mean, at this point, maybe it's boring to even talk about, but it, it's something that affected all of our lives. Uh, how did the pandemic uh, affect your artistic output? What, what sort of things were you then um, doing to shuffle around and still create? Yeah. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I don't know. I think maybe it's 
twofold. One, um, because I think the thing, the reality for me is that like whatever affects my spirit is going to affect how I interact and engage in the studio or in film, as a lot of films were made during (laughs) the (laughs) pandemic. I think the one thing I'd say is that um, what I chose to focus on during the pandemic or be reminded of is what I can do. Mm -hmm. I think it's easy for people for whatever reason to focus on what they can't do when, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're faced with adversity. But I think for me, it allowed me to focus on all the things I I could do and uh, that I can't do. Um, so there's that. I think the other component for me is uh, a lot of the work that I was doing on myself during that time, the reflection that I tried to make space to do and realize um, what it really means to, to um, focus and prioritize trust um, and how that affects my the space in the studio. Um, and the big understanding for me is that it's a, every day is a new negotiation new negotiation with trust with whomever I'm interacting with. And so Mm -hmm. trying to remember that for myself, but also make that space for whoever I'm interacting with to, you know, hopefully have them realize that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Had you done any forays into film before you mentioned it had, was that something you'd been doing before and how did you play with it during the pandemic? Yeah, I guess I, you know, I, I dabbled <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, working at City Ballet in particular and working on um, the film I made with them during the pandemic, when we fell, that was in a lot of ways a really great process and project because of the means and the level of support that they can provide. Right. Um, so that was really exciting. And I did learn new things. I think in a lot of ways, working with um, Ryan Marie Helfant as a, my co-director on that project, it really showed me what I should have had in a lot of other film projects where it's like a true collaboration. I think what happens a lot of times that I think doesn't get acknowledged is choreographers are actually doing a lot of the direction and they're not getting the credit or they're and or they're doing the art direction and not getting credit mm-hmm. um, for whatever reason. <laughs> so it, it was yeah. really special to be in a project where like there really was that great repartee where, you know, I'm sending things to Ryan. He's sending things to me. We're going back and forth. And it really was a true collaboration. A lot of times I'm really doing all of the things mm-hmm. and get that credit of choreographer. Right. right. Yeah. It's so funny. I've never heard of an artist being denied appropriate credit yeah. for their work before. It's <laughs> wild. How could that happen to you? <laughs> um, let's shift gears and talk about the work that's going to be at Stanford Live. We're back on stage. We're so happy that you got, you're going out there. Tell us a little bit about the work. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah. Okay. Well, we did talk briefly about the fact that I was watching my Vampire Diaries and Originals yes. <laughs> and Legacy, the whole series, of all the spinoffs. <laughs> um, yeah. I think you know. So making a work to Mozart's Requiem. First off, I should say um, John Akagawa at um, the Mostly Mozart Festival in New York um, had approached me to make something. Um, that was in some ways connected to Mozart's music. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, of course, being the Debbie Downer that I actually am on the inside um, and probably outside, depending on who you're asking. Uh, I, of course, gravitated towards the Requiem. Um, mm-hmm. I also have been really obsessed with death for a host of reasons, not all positive. Well, I guess it's death can't be but so positive. Um, <laughs> thinking about just like a lot of uh, death that I was experiencing in, around me uh, when I first kind of started thinking about this project, which is more like maybe initially like 2016 doing research on oh, Requiem, wow. mm-hmm. but then getting into the studio with my dancers in 2019, I think it was, or 18. So Probably this was put on pause because of the pandemic. Well, yes and no. I mean, a lot of the work was done before the pandemic. And then once we were on the other side, I put things together that I never was able to put together. Maybe added a section, but in no way in response to the pandemic. 
Okay. Right. So you're thinking about death before the pandy came. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there have been so many. Um, Yeah. So like thinking about that. um, But I think for me, because so much of the work that I've made over the years addresses the kind of like racial injustice or just injustices that I have experienced in a lot of aspects of my life and both of you, I'm sure in different capacities as well. Like um, I I think what I wanted to do was focus on reincarnation as opposed to unjust deaths of uh, people that live uh, like me or look like me. Um, So focusing on reincarnation gave me a lot of different ways in Um, also thinking about folklore um, there was a really beautiful book that I was reading that had me thinking about it was, uh, home home going. Um, the author's name is going to escape me right now, but thinking about afterlife reincarnation, all of these things became um, sparks for this work. And with this idea around reincarnation um, and thinking about this other take or experience towards Requiem, I thought it could be really great to collaborate with um, Jay Lynn or have Jay Lynn come in and create um, a sonic um, world that um, references that Requiem mm-hmm. of most yeah. parts. <laughs> you, you're bringing up how long this work has taken to come from like a little, you know, uh, idea in your imagination to the stage. And you'd mentioned this earlier in the interview that you said like, oh, I can take years with my company if I want but you literally mean years sometimes. Like how, how long, yeah. <laughs> is, is it super common for you to take this long or uh, is it just, uh, you know, it, it depends on the piece? Um, I think it depends on on the, the work and it depends on kind of how I've thought about um, timelining things. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, the, the pan- pandemic really messed me up because I had a whole kind of curatorial eye on how I wanted the works to be experienced over the next few years. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, my board had asked me to make a five-year plan um, and I decided to make an eight-year plan, you know, oh. <laughs> over, um, but that all kind of got mixed up because of sure. this pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the timing could shift. It's like one work I wasn't planning on making, I made while we were in lockdown because of how I tend to make work. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that wasn't a, that dance wasn't supposed to exist, but it, I made it um, pretty quickly, mm-hmm. and that's like a thirty minute work. Um, but then others like this one, uh, like Requiem Fire in the Air and the Earth, and um, an Untitled Love, those were two year projects where the grants were probably or the narrative might have been written even prior to that. Mm. So you mentioned, you know, these collaborate or the um, commissions that you get like New York city Valley, for example, you have three weeks and then it's on stage. There's not a lot of time for editing. Um, in this experience, when you have so much time, how much do you go back and, you know, like you, so much, so many things happened over this time that you've been working on this piece. How much do you go back and edit and change? Hmm. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Uh, well, I think it's important for me to be asking myself, the questions around like, am I actually um, like, did, is what I wrote for my narrative, is that reflecting in what an audience would see on stage and how important is that at this stage? Um, so I need to ask that question, but I think I always have to make the space from the time I'm in the studio to a little closer to when it's going to premiere to ask those questions right. so I don't give myself sense. too much self-doubt like I have been doing here um, in London right now. <laughs> I'm like, I should, I should be just making, but I'm like, this isn't saying what I thought it was going to say. Um, yeah. So it's more, it's more trying to get, get something out, just generate and then make sure there's space to reflect. And then if there's space, even after work is premiered, maybe I will, see if all of my goals were met um, and or if new things are emerging or simmering in a way that makes me want to retool something. Can you tell us a little bit about your artistic relationship with Jalen? Like how much back and forth is there um, when you're you're asking for the, this new interpretation of the Mozart Requiem, but are you ever just like, this isn't working for me, or I would like a little bit more of this or a little longer, or a little shorter. What What is this back and forth like for you? 
Yeah, sure. Um, it's great. I mean, she and I get on really well. We are the same Zodiac. <laughs> just <laughs> we part. Um, yeah, we just, I think we get each other really well. I think we kind of like, we refer to each other as kind of like, you know, brother, sister vibes. Um, yeah, I think we both are humble and passionate enough to want feedback and receive feedback. Right. Um, because not everything is going to be perfect on either side. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there are a couple things that she went back and retooled and did new versions of, and I have done the same. Um, yeah. I think we also are inspired by the things that come up. So if she says something to me, I may be like, Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Let me, let me think about that and make sure I can push that, uh, like drive that home in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, vice versa. I think there's a section that I added in August when the dance was technically supposed to be done, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, which meant that she was going to have to make a whole other track, <laughs> um, <laughs> which she did. And I think ironically, I think like that one is still maybe being toyed with a bit mm-hmm. um, because I think both choreographically and sonically, there's still just a little something, something, even like from a scenography kind of point of view, it still could use just a little something. Right. something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's the latest that you would ever do an edit? Like how how close to the premiere would you <laughs> would you dare? Is <laughs> what I'm only I'm only laughing because I'm thinking about uh, my dear my dear friend, one of my favorite choreographers, Andrea Miller. Um, and I know that Andrea she will she she will change. You might be in the wings, and she might change the step. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, yeah there, yeah. We know choreographers like that, but I wonder. Yeah. I was just wondering for you personally. Like I don't. For me, that would be scary. I would like. I don't, I'd be like. I don't want my work. I, I don't want to take that chance. But yeah. for you, how close can you get? Well, see, that's the thing. It's like, I admire that. Uh-huh. And I, I wish that I could have that like boldness to do that. But sometimes I get so kind of caught up in how everyone else is thinking and feeling that I don't make those changes that I think are really important and integral mm-hmm. to the work. There was even like this other show, the one that um, another world premiere we had, uh, An Untitled Love, where like something as simple as like taking the plastic off the couch, like, I felt like right before the show running on and being like, this is where you want to take that plastic on the couch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I didn't do it. And instead I thought I was going to pee myself for like the first 30 minutes of the show. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Oh my God, is it going to come up? When are they going to take that plastic off? Um, so yeah, I think it can really vary, but I think depending on the level of comfort that I have, that the, collaborators have in the work and with me addressing new things I think that really is the the tell sign for me um yeah I want to make sure that whatever I say isn't gonna trip them up too much um Mm -hmm. but it's also that Martha Graham thing of like you know ripping the costume right before the dancer runs out so they do an amazing (laughs) right (laughs) right never done would never do but um (laughs) it's it's a whole other thing yeah. While we're on the topic of edits, I wonder, like, and we were talking about Justin Peck earlier, he sometimes will say that he doesn't like going back and seeing some of his earlier works just because, of course, he's evolved so much as an artist. Do you sometimes feel that way? And do you ever go back and play with early works and kind of make changes? Or is it like once it's done, it's done and you leave it in the past? Yeah, I mean, the one work that we've gone back and retold like several years later is Live Through LSMC. It's a work that premiered in 2011. Yeah. And then I think we brought it back maybe, I don't know, eight, nine years later. I can't, sadly can't remember exactly when it was because, you know, pandemic brain. But um, that was a project where like after it premiered, I think I read the reviews, but which I don't usually do at all. I just like, let me just take some space from this and, you know, I welcome anyone's feedback, but I may not read it for my own kind of mental health. I think sometimes Mm -hmm. even if it's favorable and there's one offline, I'll be distraught for a really, really long time. Um, But when I knew we were bringing that work back, I thought it was a good chance for me to go back and look at the critique and see, you know, what I agreed with or what I didn't. And also taking myself out of the work allows the work to kind of have a different journey in a, in a you know, a cool or fun way. So in, in those aspects, um, I, I think there's space for change. And I, I think I do like to do that when, when it's kind of a remounting other, other works. I don't know if I have that capability. Like I know New York city ballet is about to do the runaway again. 
And when I watched the video, I'm like, oh, that one section, I could use a little love, you know. Um, but it's also like, yeah, it's it's tricky. It's tricky. Like thinking New York Public Library, you know, wanting to have your work. And I'm happy they do have you mm-hmm. know some of my work. But I'm like, I don't know if I want people to see this certain work and have that be the work that they, you know, kind of um, um, like document, right? Yeah. And, or like, yeah. that's, you know, or like any staff put up, yeah, associate with me, you know, they put like photos up of like, you know, our 10, 15 year anniversary. I'm like, oh, that dance. Oh, I don't know. y'all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Taylor Swift's redoing her whole discography. I'm like, that's just like forcing yourself to go back and watch videos of yourself dancing, like as an apprentice. Woo, nightmare. You know, but, <laughs> but here's the thing though that's interesting about that. I do think again, just, you know, you know, uh, diverging kind of personality. I think um, uh, a lot of people's first albums are the best because that's like the hungry album, you know, that's true too. You know, they're like so much material. And then at a certain point, you're so busy that you're just kind of like, hopefully not going through the motions, but you're like, Oh, just send me those songs and I'll pick a few. Right. Right. Well, I'm proud of you for waiting 40 whole minutes to bring up Taylor Swift. Oh, it does. Yeah. I'm just, I'm very, very, I can't stop. Can't stop, won't stop. I just, well, it's yeah. like, so, I mean, I'm, I'll, we don't, we can 100% cut this out. But for me, I'm also a huge Mariah fan, a big lamb. Oh, yeah. Amy. And I'm it's lamb. like these, these moments, these pop culture moments where there, it's, if you love an artist, it becomes about something bigger than that song, right? So when We Belong Together came out, having witnessed her, like, be dragged through the press and like, mm-hmm. like literally like claw her way back up. Like as a fan, it was actually kind of a fun moment. I lived in New York. And so it was so easy to see her anywhere, like small yeah, audiences. Okay. And she was hungry, you know, she just wanted to be back. And then to have that moment, it just felt like something like, you know, if we all like an inspirational moment of like, you know what, this moment of pain will pass. And, um, you know, you're going to have moments of joy again. You know, it's not over till it's over sort of thing. Yeah, I'm going to try and stay on top of it because I, I could go on that Mimi train for a good while. I'm like, but why not just use that same team to produce another album? Because well, that then, was- yeah, then you get six, then you get back to the top and then you start surrounding yourself with yes people again. Yeah. Yes, people are the devil. You need someone to be like, that sucked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the dresses get shorter and the songs <laughs> get thinner. Every, you know, it's just. <laughs> yeah. But I still buy them because I love me some yeah. <laughs> Guys, I'm keeping that in. I liked it. I think it was valid <laughs> to our conversation. <laughs> but I do want to pop back into um, December 4th's performance at Stanford Live. What are you hoping ultimately that audiences will take away from this work? Well, hmm, tricky, tricky. Because, I mean, I have no control over that really, really, do I? Fair. <laughs> That's true. I mean, I hope... I just, I think, you know, for me, this is our kind of like Stanford debut. We've never performed in the area. The closest we've performed would be at Yerba Buena um, with two works that are nothing at all like this one. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I don't know. I think, I hope people just, I hope people take in the work and um. I don't know. I hope they're inspired. I hope they have a good time. It sounds really like boring to say, but um, it's true. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think maybe part of the, yeah, I think that's all I'm going to say because I think there's certain things that I would say that I don't want to even be part of the conversation. Mm. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Let people take from it whatever they want, which is always the best way to enjoy art, honestly, right? Yeah, I think it's part of the thing that drives me crazy with dance versus, you know, what people perceive to be visual art, because I don't know how dance is not a visual art. I just don't. It just Mm -hmm. is. But we don't get those coins. And, you know, people will go to see like, you know, a a Pollock or, you know, uh, whomever else and Mm -hmm. not talk about how they don't get it. They're just like, oh, that's great. That's amazing. But why can't that happen with dance? Mm -hmm. I just don't, I don't get it. We don't get that funding. All Mm -hmm. we get is that people don't get it. I don't, it's, it's drives me up a wall. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Like, why don't we have the, Where's our money? <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was at the opera. I went to see La OM at the Met. And it was, yeah. of course, it was incredible. But you're just like, I was just so stunned by, I just think, imagining how many, I mean, millions and millions of dollars had to have gone into that production. You have like 200 people on stage. The sets are so extravagant and gorgeous. And then you have 3,000 people sold out house. I'm just like, where? Justice for dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 real. It's very real. Um, it's mm. Well, we're so glad that you took the time to chat with us and share this project with us. We're so excited to, we hope that our listeners who are in the Stanford area will go out to see it. And just before we wrap up, tell us where all of our listeners can find you and the company if they wanted to. Oh, do you mean on like the social medias? On the social yeah. medias. Drop, drop, <laughs> drop here. Oh, yeah. Um, the company is aimed by Kelly Abraham on all platforms, I'm pretty sure, um, and the website. And then I am Kyle underscore, a lot of underscores, just put one in between every word as I say these words, <laughs> Kyle original recipe, Kyle Abraham original recipe. That is amazing. Me. I think that's all the things. I think the other social media things are different handles. But to be honest, I can't remember them. I really can't. Okay. okay. We'll find you on Insta. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank thanks again, so Kyle. It was so, so lovely chatting. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank you.